All right, combining probabilities. So we did 7a, which was the basic fundamentals, and now we're going to get a little bit more in depth with probabilities, a little more difficult than what we did in 7a, but nothing that you can't um, figure out. So we're going to talk about different ways of com what we call combining probabilities, the and probabilities, the or probability questions. So as we're working through this, we'll want to really pay attention to the wording of the problems That's where it gets a little tricky. Okay, now let's talk about what they call the and probability or independent events. Independent events with the and probability. Two events are considered independent if the outcome of one does not affect the probability of the other event. If the outcome of one, so they'll be independent if the outcome of one does not affect the probability of the other. So let's say um, the outcome of one, let's say I have, um, I think we'll do one example like this, but let's say I have a box of chocolates. Um, if I replace that chocolate, like if I touch it and replace it, even though that's probably not a good, great idea, if I have a box of chocolate and I take one and I put it back, then that outcome, that, that, that just, what just happened is not going to affect the probability of me selecting the next one because I put it back. So, I, so it doesn't, it's independent of the probability of the other event happening. And we'll do some examples to um, help this make a little more sense. Okay, so if two independent events happen and they want to know the probability that A and B happen together, okay, if two independent events, if they're independent and they have their own individual probabilities and we want to know the probability that they occur together, notice that they say the probability of A and B happening together. There are things that can't happen together, right? Um, um, such as, um, it's either sunny outside or it's not sunny, right? So probability of it being sunny and not sunny at the same time is really not plausible. But there'll be two independent events. And if you want to find those probability, if you know the probability of each individual probability, then you multiply. So the AND probability, you can just put a little multiplication sign next to it. So when they talk about AND, you put a multiplication sign next to it to know that you're going to multiply the individual probabilities. This could be um, multiple uh, probabilities. So let's say I want to know the probability that the person is female, is wearing purple shoes, and has a hoodie on. Okay, those probabilities, I would multiply each of those probabilities together. So this can extend up to as many probabilities as you'd like. I mean, we will probably only do up to three, but you can extend this up to a lot of probabilities. So if they're using the and, then you multiply the probabilities. And again, this can be extended up to any number of independent events. So three, two, eight different probabilities. So and, indicates multiplication. So here is the example. What is the probability of rolling three sixes in a roll with a single die? So you have a single die. What's the probability of rolling three sixes in a roll, in a, in a, in a row? So let's first figure out if they're independent. When I roll a die, does the outcome of my first one, let's say I roll a two, Will that affect the probability when I roll it a second time? Not, not unless you erase the two from the face of the die, right? So if, if all else is equal, by me rolling the die the first time, it's not going to affect that probability the second time. So that's an example of an independent event. So what is the probability, let's first of all figure out the probabil probability of rolling a six on a single die. What is that probability? One out of six, right, because there's one three on the die, so and there's six sides, so one out of six. So if we know that probability, and they want to repeat this, they want to know, basically the question is, what is the probability of rolling a three, three sixes, sorry. What is the probability of rolling a six, and rolling a six, and rolling a six? So if you put that and in there, that's going to indicate multiplication. 
So although the problem statement doesn't say and, 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 that's basically what we have to assume, that this is an and probability indicating multiplication because we're going to do one time, roll a six, and then the second time I roll a six, and then the third time I roll a six. So if we know that individual probability, we can use the multiplication of three sixes in a row, and that becomes one six times one six times one six. And again, these can be represented as either fractions, or you can represent it as a decimal. So one out of two sixteen. So not a great probability. That's why games like, uh, like, do you remember Yahtzee? Does anybody ever remember Yahtzee? I mean, that is that even still out there? It's a family staple. Of yeah, life. there you go. So family staple, Yahtzee, where you have to like roll the doubles like that. I mean, the probability, even if we just did two sixes in a row, it's one out. Of, so one out of thirty-six. So it's really not that great either. But as you extend, it makes it more difficult. Any questions on that one? Okay. Now what if the events are the events are dependent and they're talking about and? So we just looked at an independent event. But what if the events are dependent upon each other? So two events are dependent if the outcome of one affects the probability of the other. The outcome of one affects the probability of another. So again, we're still using the and probability. So the and probability is multiplication, right? Except what happens is we have a slight change in the second probability when we're using, when we have dependent events. So let's look at an example. If the probability, let's say you just have two and you're doing two, the probability of two dependent events, meaning that the probability of the second is dependent upon the first probability. You first find the probability of A, and then you still use the multiplication, but the second probability changes. What you do is you assume B, the probability of B, given, when it says B given A, that means the probability of B given A actually occurred. Given A actually occurred. Okay, so what I'm going to do is let me go back to the independent and then I'm going to do the dependent with this example so that way you can see the differences. Okay, so the independent uh, event, let's go back to the independent with the and probability. Okay, so let's um, do an example. Again, I have a box of chocolates in my hand and I walk around and in that box of chocolates I have five caramel um, and then five solid chocolates. So there's 10 chocolates in all. Five of them have the caramel inside. Five of them are just solid chocolate. Okay, and so I walk around the room and I ask Ryan to point out, don't touch, because of COVID, right? To point out to me which one of these he thinks just blindly, just select one, tell me to point one and we'll, we're gonna see if it's caramel or if it's chocolate. And I, I'll know because the back of the box has it. So I go to Ryan and Ryan picks out, say, number two. What's the probability out of all of the chocolates that he's going to pick out a caramel one? If there's 10 chocolates, what's that? 50%. 50% because if there's five out of 10 or one half or 50%, there's five caramels. He didn't take it out of the box and eat it. He just pointed at it to me. And that's the probability, right? So then I go to Crystal and I say, okay, tell me what the probability is of, uh, so select one, tell me which one, which number, and you pick number seven. What's the probability that that is solid chocolate? Same. Same, right? Because there was five out of 10. So the probability, again, she didn't eat it. She put it back in the box or she just, I, I have it in the box and I'm just walking around and I'm enticing everybody with these chocolates, right? Notice that the outcome, when I asked the second probability, it didn't affect the outcome of the first one because the boxes, the box of chocolate is kept together. I didn't give anybody out. I didn't give anybody's um, uh, a piece of chocolate. I just walked around and asked you to pick a number of one and we determine what the probability was. 
those were independent events, but it's the and probability. So if I wanted to know that the probability that he picked a caramel on the first one and she picked a caramel uh, chocolate one on the second one, I would take one half times one half or 50% times 50% and that would give me my probability. Now let's, turn, let's do that in terms of a dependent event. So again, the probability of A multiplied times the probability of B given that A happened. So let's see if we have the, um, let me bring up the same chocolate example. So now we're looking at that box of chocolates and now I take it around and again I start off and I say, okay, Ryan, um, go ahead and pick, the, pick from the box and you can actually take it and you sample it and then let me know what, the, what it was because I want to know what the probability that, that what he got from the box was, was caramel. So he picks it out, takes it out, right? And, and he says, oh, okay, it's karma. Well, that probability we knew was 50%. Okay, so we knew that. So we would take 50% or one half times. Now the second one, notice that there's only how many chocolates left in the box? He took the one, right? So he took that chocolate out of the box and it was caramel, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that the second probability, now when I go around and give someone else a chance, the probability of B given that A has occurred. So what we're going to assume is that uh, probability of A has occurred, so that reduces the number of chocolates to nine, and the probability of giving a caramel the second time, for example, is actually going to be less. It's instead of 50%, instead of it's going to be four, so four out of nine. So notice that second fraction actually changes. So the, the dependent event is that he took, the, he took that chocolate out of the box. It's no longer in there. The event occurred. And that's how we're going to treat the second probability, as if it actually happened. Okay, so think of it in those terms. So instead of having 10 chocolates, now we have nine in our denominator. And the probability of him picking um, a caramel or someone picking a caramel that next time is actually only four because instead of having five caramels, we assume that the first probability actually happened. Okay, so let's do another example. And one of the things you can just consider an easy way to think about the and probability with dependent events, you reduce the denominator and you reduce the numerator by, numerator by one. That's really the simple, simple trick. And that's what we did in that example. A three-person jury must be selected at random from a pool of people that has six men and six women total. So that's 12. We're starting off with 12 people. And the probability, six, six out of 12, six out of 12, that's good. That's a nice number, 50%. So what is the probability of selecting an all-male jury? Notice the question, the way it's posed. It doesn't say, what is the probability of selecting a man and then selecting another man and then selecting another man and then selecting another man? You know, it doesn't say that. So there's three people in this example. So we need to select three and they need to be all male. So it's, it's a male and a male and a male. So this is the and probability and we're going to do multiplication. So let's first figure out the probability Let's first figure out if this is independent or dependent. Well, we know from the fact that we're doing dependent uh, that this is a dependent event, but let's explain why. If I have a three-person jury where I have 12 people to select from, um, when, if they want to know the probability of selecting an all-male, when I select the first one, that probability is 6 out of 12 or 1 half. But the second probability, because of the fact that that affects, I'm, I'm taking from that, from that sample size. I'm actually taking a person, I'm reducing. So therefore, that second probability changes. And again, the easiest way to think about this for dependent events is the second probability actually becomes you subtract one from the denominator and you subtract one from the numerator. So on that second probability, we only have 11 people to choose from. We're gonna assume that a man was chosen on the first one so there's only five men out of 11 total people. So that's the probability of B given A has occurred. So our first slot, let's do the first slot. The first slot, 
um, is going to be um, 6 out of 12 or 1 out of 2. And then I'm going to multiply the second one, 5 out of how many? 11, right? And then the third one becomes 4 out of 10. So there's three slots to fill here. The first one is 6 out of 12 or a half. The second one is 5 out of 11. And the third one is 4 out of 10. So you see when we're doing the dependent events, the numerator reduces by 1, and so does the denominator. And then you multiply those across. It's 120 out of 1,320, which is a really small percent. It's 0 0.09. So 9% um, or 0 0.09 uh, probability of selecting an all-male jury when you have a three-person jury. If we had four, we would do, what would be the fourth value? Three out of how many? Three out of nine, because those are dependent events. All right, any questions on that one? Okay. Okay, now let's talk about the either or the or. So we did and, and probability is we use multiplication, right? And then of course the, the probability calculation changes if you have independent versus dependent. Now let's talk about either or probability. So we, with either or probabilities, we have overlapping and non-overlapping. Non-overlapping events are events that cannot occur together, like when you toss a coin. It can only be either a head or a tail. It can't be both, okay? So when I toss a single coin, it's a head or a tail. It's not both, all right? So that would be a non-overlapping event because they can't occur at the same time. When we have an either or event that's non-overlapping, okay, that means that they can't occur at the same time. For the events A and B, instead of doing multiplication, now that we're doing ors, we actually do adding. So we take the probability of A of the first event happening plus the probability of B, the second event happening. So the probability of A or B is the probability of A plus, not multiplied, plus the probability of B. And let's do an example. I think we're going to go back to the example with the die. Okay, so let's suppose you roll a single die again. What's the probability of rolling either a two or a three? Notice how they're using the word either and they're using the word or two or three. So if we go back to our probability of either or, I'm going to roll a single die once. They're non-overlapping because I can't, when I roll a die, I can't roll a two and a three and a four at the same time. I can only roll one value. One value will come up. So what's the probability of rolling a two or a three? So this is an either or. The question is the probability of A or B is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B. So what we have to do is find the probability of the two. What's the probability of rolling a two? One, one six. What's the probability of rolling a three? One six. One six. So the probability of a two is one out of six. The probability of a three is one out of six. One six plus one six. One third. Yeah, it ends up with two out of six or one third, right? When we add fractions, if they have the same denominator, we just keep the denominator and we add the two numbers on top. And now 2 6 equals 1 third, so 1 out of 3. So you have a 1 out of 3 chance when you have a single die of rolling a 2 or a 3. Now notice that they posed it as or. So we, it wouldn't be able to be and. Okay. But one of, the, one of the things they could do is they could say, let's say you roll a single die twice, what's the probability of getting a two, and then a three, and then a six, or something like that. And then you would actually, if they're using the word and, then you would do multiplication. 
Okay. Um, okay, let me see if I'm done with the non-wrapping. Yeah, I guess. Um, okay, let's say I have a, some cards. I see some in the back over here. Let me see if I can read some of them. cards that I took from the back. Let's see if I can show this up here. Five cards. Yay, five cards. Okay. So in this deck of cards that you see, or this little, I have five different cards. I have um, a two of spades, a nine of clubs, uh, a king of clubs, a two of hearts, and a... Ten of diamonds. Okay, I don't play cards. You can probably tell. Um, okay, so I have. So let's just put them in terms of. We're gonna say three black cards, and I have two red cards. Okay, three black cards and two red cards. So I have a total of five. Um, for this is a non-overlapping because if I select a card from here, it can't be a two, and it can't be. I mean, it can't be a two of spades and also a two of hearts at the same time. They're all, they're all, these are all different. There's no, there's no same ones in here. Okay, so out of this deck of cards, what is the probability that I will select either, okay, out of this, either a, I don't know what that is, it is a club, sorry, a king of clubs or a, a, Two of hearts. Either notice that I'm saying either or. So I select one card from here. What's the probability that I select a king of clubs or a two of hearts? Well, what's the probability that I select a king of clubs from this deck? One fifth, right? Because there's five cards, I'm gonna select one, and it's one fifth. What's the probability of selecting a two of hearts? also one-fifth, right? So I'm using the either or probability, and then what I do is add, right? So one-fifth plus one-fifth? Two-fifths. It's two-fifths, exactly. Okay. Now, two events are overlapping, overlapping. If they actually can occur together, in this diagram we can see cards again. So, the outcome of picking a queen or a club is actually possible. You can pick a queen and it can also be a club in this example. So every um, deck of cards has 13 um, so has four uh, suits and 13 of each suit. So you can see here the overlapping. So they're using this Venn diagram to show the overlapping events. I can select a queen and I can select a club so these can be over what we call overlapping events. So what we were looking at before was non-overlapping with or. Now we're looking back, now we're looking at overlapping events with this concept of either or. And the probability changes slightly. So for overlapping events, events that actually can happen together, the probability is the first part of the probability is the same as non-overlapping. You take the probability of A plus the probability of B. However, if the events are overlapping, you subtract the probability and of A and B occurring together. Okay, so if it's possible that an event can occur at the same time, and it's an or probability, you take the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability that they occur together. So we're going to do an example of an overlapping event so you can see how this is actually applied with the either or. Okay. Okay, so in a standard shuffled deck of cards that you will draw a five or a spade. So first we all have to know how cards work. Again, there's four suits and there's 13 cards in each suit. Um, 
So what is the probability that you draw a five or a spade? Okay, so they're using the word or, so I know that I'm gonna use the or probability. Now I have to de de uh, determine if they're, in de if they're overlapping or non-overlapping. Okay, are they overlapping? Can I draw, is it possible for me to draw a five and a spade? Yes, so they're overlapping. So then I have to use the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B occurring together. Okay, so let's, what's the probability of, of, of drawing a five from a, a deck of cards? Now again, there's 52 cards in a deck and there's four suits. So I know my denominator is gonna be 52, but drawing a five, how many fives do I have in there? There's four, so four out of 52. So the probability of drawing a five, it's important for me to know what that probability is, four out of 52. Or you can reduce that to one out of 13 if you want. And then the spade, what's the probability of drawing a spade? Again, there's four suits and there's 13 cards in each suit. So here they're just af asking for a spade. How many spades are there out of 52? 13. There's 13. Okay, so now that we have those two, we have to figure out, okay, so we have the probability of A and we have the probability of B. What about the probability of A and B? What is the probability of, of a five and a spade in a deck of cards? One, there's only one five of spades in a deck of cards. And it's better if I, if you, if I had a deck of cards to show you um, this information. I thought I might have had a deck of cards. Um, okay, so the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B. We just determined what those were, so now we just have to do the math. The probability of a five was four out of 52 or one out of 13. Now, notice that they kept the denominator the same, and the reason why is because it makes the fractions a lot easier to work with. If you change that, if you had reduced the four out of 52 to one out of 13, then when you're adding the fractions and doing all that, you're just gonna have to convert the fractions to like, frac like denominators, and then it's more work. So the probability of five was four out of 52. The probability of a spade, we said, was 13 out of 52. And the probability of drawing a five and a spade was only one out of 52. So we do the math. When we're adding and subtracting with fractions, we keep the denominator, the same denominator, and then we just add and subtract the numerators. So four plus 13 is 17 minus one is 16 out of 52. And then finally, at the very end, we do the reducing, which is four out of 13. Okay, any questions on that one? So you'll have to pay attention to a, a few things. You'll have to pay attention to whether they're saying and. You'll have to pay attention to whether they're saying or. When we're doing the and probability, you'll have to pay attention to whether it's independent or dependent. Um, and uh, when we're doing or probabilities, you'll have to determine if it's overlapping or non-overlapping. Non-overlapping, overlapping kind of mean the same thing as independent and dependent. It's just different probabilities. One is and, the other one is or. Okay, let me see if I have another example of this one. Let's do, um, I do have another example in the book, but not in PowerPoint, so let me turn on the draw cam. Okay, so we're going to do another example of the uh, overlapping uh, or probability. Okay, the question is, the following eight people are in a room. There's two Democratic men, two Republican men. Okay, so two, two Democratic men, two Republican men, um, two Democratic women, and two Republican women. Okay, so there are eight, there's eight people all together. Okay, so two Democratic men, two Republican men, 
two de Democratic women and two Republican women. If you select one person at random from the room, what is the probability that you will select either, either a woman or a Democrat? Either a woman or a Democrat. Okay, so is it possible, so the case, the question is either a woman or a Democrat. So the question is to determine whether this is overlapping or non-overlapping because we already know it's an either or, is we ask ourselves, can it be a woman and a Democrat at the same time? According to this information, we do, that we have some female Democrats, right? Some women Democrats in, the, in, the, in this room. So it is possible, so they are overlapping events, so we know that we're going to use this probability that we have up here. The probability of A or B when it's overlapping is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B. So let's figure out the probability of A. What is the probability of selecting a woman from a total of eight people in a room? So there's eight is my denominator. How many of those are women? Four. There's four. So now let's, because there's two Democratic women and two Republican women, so that's four altogether out of eight. Leave your denominator that way, don't reduce just yet, because we're gonna be dealing with eight again in the next one. So we have four out of eight. Now how many are Democrats altogether? There's eight, and then how many are Democrats? It doesn't say, the second piece doesn't say uh, female Democrat, it just says, a woman or a Democrat. How many are Democrats? Four. Four. Okay, so we have another four out of eight, right? So four out of eight in the first one, four out of eight in the second one. Now what we do is we find the probability of being those two together, female or a woman Democrat. So there's eight all together in the room. How many are female Democrats? Two. Two. So two out of eight is my last one. Okay, so I write those down and then I do the math. Four out of eight plus four out of eight minus two out of eight. And that's going to give me my... Okay, so they reduced here in the book. I went ahead and wrote it over here. Four out of eight plus four out of eight minus two out of eight. So you have eight out of eight minus two is six out of eight, which reduces to three fourths. Now, if you had actually done the reduction like they did here, so they reduced, reduced, and let's and then they reduced the last one too. But now they got, they had to do math because you can't just do the math to get to three quarters, in case you didn't remember that. These have different denominators, so you would have to find the common denominator, which is four, and then changes to two out of four, two out of four minus one out of four, which comes out to three fourths. So you actually, so I prefer to just keep it this way and do the math before you do the reduction, keep the denominators the same, and then and then do it that way. Okay, so you have to read the questions carefully here to determine whether they're and or, they're or probabilities, if they're independent or dependent for and, and if they're overlapping versus non-overlapping uh, for the ors. Okay, now let's look at something called the at least once rule. These are for independent events independent events. All right, suppose the probability of an event A occurring in a trial is the P of A, or probability of A. If all the trials are considered to be independent, the probability that event A occurs, bless you, at least once in n number of trials is shown below. Now, you'll, you'll see the at least once problems and you'll notice them right away, so you'll know to use this uh, probability formula right away because the problem will say at least once. It's very obvious. What is the probability that this occurs at least once in 20 trials? Or if I roll this 15 times, what is the probability of this occurring at least once? Okay, so the probability of an at least one event in a number of trials, what you need is you need to know how many trials are happening and then you need to determine that probability. That's, that's all you have to do, and then you just do the math. So it's one minus the probability that there is no actual event 
in a single trial, and then you raise it to the number of trials. So it's one minus the probability that no events, that events are not happening in a single trial, and then you raise it. So the, this one right here is the one that I would write down. This one is kind of just the, the uh, precursor to the final formula. It's one minus the entire probability that no events happen, none of these events happen in a single trial, and then you raise that probability to the n power, and then you take one minus that value. So we'll do an example of that. Okay. See, again here they're saying use the at least once rule. So they're telling you to use the at least once rule. To find the probability of at least one head when you toss three coins. At least one head when you toss three coins. How many trials are happening here? How many trials are we doing? Three, because we're tossing the coin three times. Then we need to know what's the probability of when you toss a single coin, what's the probability of a head? Of getting a head when you toss a single coin? 50%, right, or one half? Okay, so what you do is follow this formula. We know how many trials, n is three, we know the probability that it's, that event would happen. What's the probability that it doesn't actually happen? No A in one trial. So in this case, no head in one trial. That means it would get 50%, right? Because it would be, then it would be a tail. So 50% and that's going to be, so 0.5 raised to the third power. We have to do that in our calculators if you don't know how to do that. So no head of one toss would be 0.5 or one half raised to the third or one eighth. So you could actually um, write it as one half raised to the third, which is one half times one half times one half. Or you can also write it as 0.5 raised to the third. And let's see, 0.5 to 0.25, and then what is that, 0.75, 0 0.125, let's see. So 0.5, if I had done it, the other way, so 0.5 times 0.5 times 0.5 is 0.125, so 1 minus that comes out to 0.875, which is the same as 7 out of 8. So if you, you'll, and when you're doing the Pearson homework, you'll want to pay attention to whether they want it as a fraction or if they want it as a decimal or if they're okay. Um, I think in these cases they may want them as a fraction. Have it, has anybody done the 7A yet so far to determine, are they wanting fractions or is it, is it in interchangeable? Fractions and decimals? I think it's fractions and decimals. Yeah. yeah, okay, so it's both. Okay, so pay attention to how they want you to determine the answer. Because a lot of times you might actually have the right answer and you just didn't see the instructions that it says use a fraction instead of a decimal. So. Um, just pay attention. So that's the first thing that I always look at, um, or I, I should say I at least tell students I haven't done the Pearson homework in a little over five years, um, because when I assign these problems, I actually do them myself too to make sure that, that, that they're um, good problems to do. Um, but it's been a while and I know they've made some upgrades. So seven out of eight in this example. Again, you have to take the probability, so first find the probability of the event happening and then you can find the not probability. And how do you find the not probability? You just take one minus that, right? And that's what goes in the probability section. You raise it to the number of trials. Okay, let's see if I have another example with not. Okay, yeah we do. You purchase 10 lottery tickets for which the probability of winning some type of prize on a ticket is one in 10. Okay, so they're giving me a lot of, of good information here. You purchase 10 lottery tickets, right? How many trials is that? 10. 10, so I already have my N for my formula. For which the probability of winning some type of prize on a single ticket is one out of 10. So the probability of A occurring is one out of 10. What's the probability of A not occurring? Nine out of 10. Nine out of 10. So that's why it kind of stinks to play the lottery because the statistics are not good. So nine out of 10 chance of not winning, that's the number that we're going to use, right, in our formula for 10 trials. 
and then notice that they say what's the probability that you will have at least one winning ticket again they're using the at least one rule okay so here's how we get it the probability of winning at least one with 10 tickets is 1 minus the probability of not winning in a single trial and raised to the 10th power. Well, we said that they, they gave us the probability of winning was uh, 1 out of 10, so that means the probability of not winning was 9 out of 10 or 0.9. So in this example, they're using a decimal. So 0.9 raised to the 10th power is a huge, huge number. I bet if you try to put that in your calculator, you're going to get um, some numbers. So let me do 0.9 raised to the 10th power. I get a big number that approximates, it's 0.348678. So it's a really small decimal. So 0.34867, I think. One minus that. And that's why they have the approximation of the little approximation squigglies of 0.651. So they rounded to the thousands place. Um, since I mentioned that on the calculator, a lot of times I will get questions via email or um, students will ask me in class that when they're doing their calculation on their calculator, <clears throat> they think something's wrong with it because they're seeing a number and it says e to the 10 or it'll say e to the 25 or it'll say 2.5 e to the 17 or something like that. And they think that the E represents an error, where in fact that is just scientific notation. So if it's a positive number, so like 2.5 E to the 17 in your calculator just means it's 2.5 with 17 zeros after that. So you have to move the decimal 17 places to the right. If you have a number and it says E to the negative 10 or something, or E to the negative 5, it's that number and you have to move the decimal place that many places to the left. So just FYI, if you get any really big numbers, that's what happens. And I, don't, and I don't think in this case where we're doing probability that you'll end up with really crazy weird numbers like that. So, um, but I just wanted to give you an FYI on that. Okay, so. Okay, let's see if we have another example of this. Okay, so we don't, so let me. Take you to the dot cam and we'll do another example. Okay, so you see this example down here talking about the 100 year flood. Okay, so I'll give you, I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to try this one, and it's at least, it's the at least once rule. Okay, the at least once rule. Okay, so the question says, find the probability that a region will experience at least one, and the event is the 100 year flood a flood, and then they put in parentheses, so they're giving you a, a hint here, is a flood that has a .01 chance of occurring in any given year. So during the next, okay, during the next 100 years, assume, it says what is, okay, the probability that a region will experience at least one 100 year flood during the next 100 years. So how many trials do we have that we're looking for? during the next 100 years? We have the probability of the actual flood happening. So you have to use your at least once rule to take one minus the probability of the event not happening in a year. Remember, the, it's, it's actually the inverse, remember? The formula, should I show the formula? Yes. Okay. Okay, so the probability of at least one event happening 
one in one of the events that you're looking at in n trials is the second one here so the, it's the probability of that event not happening in a single trial raised to the n and then when you get that number you take one minus that probability so you have to know the number of trials and you have to know the probability of that event not happening what they give us is the chance that the event happens, or usually what we know is the event, the probability that the event will happen. We have to figure out the event not happening in order to put it into this equation and raise it to the number of trials. That's what we've been doing all along with the examples that we've been doing here. So when you're tossing a, uh, a head, we didn't, we didn't find out, even though it just turned out to be 50%, what we had to find out is the probability in three trials, because we knew there were three coins, we had to find the probability that there was not a head, because they're wanting to know at least one. So the probability that there was not a head in a single toss is, is 50%. So you have to find the inverse of that. And then in the second one, we did that example, we did the same thing. We did, okay, they wanted to know what's the probability of a getting at least one winning lottery ticket. Well. We know the number of trials was 10. We know the probability of a winning ticket, and we had to solve for the probability of not getting a winning ticket in order to plug it into the formula and figure out what that value was. Okay, so now we're gonna do the same thing, but just applying to this one-year flood. Okay, so they're telling you, they, bless you, they're finding the probability that a region will experience at least one 100-year flood during the next 100 years. So I know my number of trials is the next 100 years that we're looking at. They tell me that a flood has a 0 .01 chance of occurring in any given year. I, now that I know that, I have to figure out the probability of not occurring in any given year. Right? Okay, and then you plug it into the formula to figure what that is. Does that make sense? So that's important. They give us the probability, but then we have to find the actual opposite in order to plug it into the formula when we use the at least once rule. So that's 0.99. So now if we plug it into the formula, it's going to be 1 minus quantity 0.99 raised to the number of trials. 1 minus the probability of that event not happening, which was 0.99. The number of trials was 100 because they asked us for 100 years. If they could have said, I think it's, it's kind of uh, confusing because they use 100 a lot in this one, but they could say over the next 20 years, and then it would have been 20, it would have been raised to the 20th power instead of the 100th. But they just so happen to be talking about 100 year flood, 100 years, you know, they keep talking about it and it gets confusing. But the number of trials is definitely 100 and they wanted to know that probability of it happening at least once. So you find this in your calculator, 0.99 raised to the 100th power. So if I take 0.99 and raise it to the 100th power. 0.6339 Okay, so I got, I got 0.366, right? 0.99 raise it to the 100th power. 0.36603? No, but I'm just talking about this piece. Oh, okay. Right? So 0.99 raised to the 100th power, and then take 1 minus that value. Or if, you have, if you're using order of operations in your calculator, you should get 0.6339 or estimated, and that's why they have the squiggly lines, that's what this means, approximately 0.634 if I round it to the thousands place. Okay, so that's tricky because you don't want, you want to make sure not to use the actual probability here with the at least once rule, okay? The at least once rule, you use the inverse of that, of it not happening. And most of the time they're going to give you the probability that it actually does occur, and you have to figure out the probability that it doesn't by taking one minus that because we learned that. Okay, any questions on the at least once rule? Okay. 
lessons. In the book, they will they have headers that say the either or probabilities, at least once problems. Um, they also call these ones the and probabilities. So they're kind of giving you a little bit of a clue as to what kind of probability that you're going to be doing. So I assume that online Pearson will also do that. So it'll list these key words that you'll need to know in order to know whether you're going to be multiplying when combining probabilities, which is the and probability. You're going to be adding when using the or probabilities. Um, and making sure that you have the independent versus the uh, dependent for and and the overlapping versus non-overlapping for the ors and then the at least once rule that'll be obvious because it'll say at least once and the homework assignment okay so that's all for 7b